Welcome. <coughs> Welcome to the Adobe Storytelling. This is the first for our 2023 series. I'm excited to have Mike Williams Jr. with us tonight. Sorry about that. Now you can hear me. Well, uh, my name is Liz Arbuckle. I'm welcoming you into the Ojibwe Storytelling Series, our first one of 2023. We're thrilled to have Mike Wiggins Jr. with us. He's the chairman for the Bad River Tribe, and Mike and I go back many, many years. A hey, Wiggs, we met uh, Head Start, I believe. We were just little ones. Um, so for tonight, what we love is we always love when you guys tell us where you're, where you're calling from or where you're tuning in from. So we've got this nice little map on the left, as you can see, of North America, but we're not limited to North America. We had some friends from, from France and Japan join us last year. We had some friends from Canada up in the northern part of North America and, of course, all over Wisconsin. Um, so uh, it's always fantastic. So if you could put that in the chat box where you are log er, you're listening in from, and on the very bottom of your screen, you'll see chat, and then there's a QA. and a um, So it would be the chat box. On the other side of the screen, I have a, a nice little map of the American Indian Reservations and Trust Lands in Wisconsin. Um, and we are joining you from way at the tippy top, uh, Bad River, live from Bad River tonight. Um, and a little further north is Red Cliff. You guys may have remembered uh, Michael Laughing Fox. He was with us last year from Red Cliff. We had Leon and Greg from Lac de Flambeau last year. And then we had Edith from Bad River last year. And this year we've got a great lineup. We have, we have Mike from uh, Bad River tonight. And then we have uh, Val Barber next week. She's going to be joining us from LCO or Lucuda Ray. And then we have Chris McGeechick from Mo Lake and Wanda McFaggin from St. Croix area. So really exciting uh, event we get to bring to you. And we're just thrilled that we get to be able to do this. Mike, can you put your uh, camera on so I can see you? Where do we got people? Land of Lakes. Okay, now I can read. McFarland, Racine. Whoa, that's way down there. And we got some friends. Oh, there's Michigan, Appleton. It's fantastic that everybody could uh, join us tonight. And um, let's see. I still can't see you, Mike. Maybe that's a problem on my end. Do you have your camera on? Okay. That must be my must be Delaware. Wow. I think that's in Maryland. That's fantastic. Mike and also Mike and I also graduated high school together. So shout out. Oh, fantastic. Uh, shout out to class of 87, Ashland High. Thanks to all our old classmates that are joining us tonight. That is also very nice to see. I think that's, did that just say Mexico, Wiggs? Are you reading the chat box as they pop up? It's going fast. <laughs> Yeah, well, just so you know, as, as um, this is going very fast, but at the end, um, I'll print all of these and share them with, with Mike um, so he can get a, you know, have, have a minute to, to say hello or, or see where everyone logged in from. And that's always, that's always a, a wonderful thing. Okay, Janet, can you put up the next slide? Just keep, keep ringing in. That's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items for this evening. As you came into the meeting, we you were automatically muted and you're going to stay automatically muted. It's, it's actually a webinar, not a meeting, so you're already muted. If you have a question for Mike at any time during this presentation, just use the Q&A box down at the bottom there. You can type the Q&A box. Any question you have, we're going to have about 10 minutes at the end um, for him to take questions. 
If, he, if we can't get to your questions and we can't get to all the questions, I will again print those off for Mike and um, give them to him. And, and if he can, he will, he said he'd be happy to, to reach out to you. Um, the chat is gonna close as soon as we turn it over to Mike and we'll reopen at the end for goodbye. So if you didn't get a chance to say where you're from or if you have a, a, a parting comment, um, um, we would love to love to see you back in the chat box with that. Okay. Oh, and the other thing is there's a there's another little button down there. It says raise hand. Um, and it's tempting because you think it means you have a question. So you should raise the hand, but actually don't raise the hand because it just raises the hand and we can't do anything about it. Um, we, we, we can only read your verbal question or excuse me, your written questions. We can't take a verbal question. So, all right, on to the next slide. Well, this actually go back to the other one. I apologize. That's Mike's uh, end slide. And with all of his contact information, I guess we could put that up now. It gives people a bit of an extra chance, eh? Yeah, you can put that back up. Um, Mike is a wonderful guy, a wonderful friend. Um, not the best at email. <laughs> You know, that's true, buddy. So, but Facebook Messenger and texting on a cell phone, he's great with that. So if you have questions for him, you can contact him off also. Um, he also wanted to recommend the Stewards of All Creation, which is a little video, about eight minutes, I believe. That's on the Bad River Tribes YouTube page that he encourages you to check out. And then at the end of the whole program, we encourage you to go to our feedback page and we will put that in probably the Q&A or the chat box for you to enter. I am gonna turn this over. Okay, Janet, you can take away my slides, please. Cause now we're gonna turn it over to Mike. And um, we're gonna go ahead and close the chat box right now. And I would like to introduce uh, Mike Wiggins Jr. from the Bad River Tribal Nation. And he will uh, be joining us for about, talking for about 50 minutes. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Well, Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, time together. I'm uh, I'm unbelievably um, honored to to be here and to be sharing a little bit with everybody. Uh, thank you to the um, Wisconsin Historical Society and everybody else that had a hand in this. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a, I'm going to assume that that uh, everybody can hear me and and my sound is okay from from uh, some of our technical folks. Um, myself, I'm not the most tech, technology, uh, how do you say it, uh, tech, technically savvy person. Uh, all of the all of the different computer uh, stuff, and I was telling Liz earlier. I said I'm. I kind of had a struggle with being um, kind of having a bad habit with Atari Pong back in the '70s and early 80s and I stayed away from technology ever since, but uh, we had a good laugh on that, but it wasn't completely untrue. Um, but <clears throat> to share a little bit tonight about, uh, you know, our Ojibwe history, to share a little bit about myself and about Bad River is, is an honor. And uh, to that end, I just want to say that uh, uh, I want to introduce myself in Ojibwe. Makade Makwa Ninjinikas, Makwa Dode Mashkazibe Nindunjaba. Uh, Black Bear is my Anishinaabe name, and uh, Bad River is my home. Uh, I'm Bear Clan, and I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm not that fluent in Ojibwe, but I have had the privilege of being tribal chairman for the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa for the last 12 years. Um, well, 12 years total, uh, 12 out of the last 14 years. And in this journey and in this, in this effort to try to serve our people and serve our community, our tribe, we've dealt with a lot of things uh, related to our lands and waters. And that's a little bit about what I want to share tonight. Um, I want to share a little bit about who we are in Bad River, as in, we, in our Ojibwe language, we call ourselves Mushkazibi. Um, Mushkazibi translates to Medicine River, so it's kind of a kind of a long ways from the notion of Bad River when you go to the Ojibwe language and it's actually Medicine River. But uh, but sharing a little bit about uh, Bad River and about where we're at within uh, Turtle Island and, uh, and, and getting a chance to share a little bit about uh, what my elders kind of told me and 
and how they helped guide me to, to this place, you know, here in 2023. So I have a, I have a little bit of a PowerPoint. And, and again, you're going to have to just bear with me as I try to negotiate the PowerPoint along with talking. But, uh, but I'll say that, uh, I'll say this, that, you know, I had elders, Joe Rose Sr. I've learned a lot from, from attending lodges and uh, participating in different ceremonies. As we in Bad River have tried to defend ourselves from uh, mining projects and, and mining companies and uh, dealt with other issues related to oil pipeline uh, transport systems and things like that, trying to protect our home. Um, there's been a there's been an incredible journey uh, in that regard, utilizing what uh, some one of my elders described as the feather and the pen. Uh, the feather on one side being our cultural ways, our ceremonies, uh, those those traditional e ecological knowledge packages that have been here for thousands of years. And on the other side of the coin, the pen, um, utilizing legalese and policy and processes with, within state and federal agencies and that balance of, of uh, trying to put all of that into play as we seek to send our our way of life, preserve our culture, preserve our lands and waters for our people. So, um, so it, we're in a special place here in Mushkazibi and Bad River. We're on the shores of Lake Superior. Our reservation ties into uh, the big lake. And, uh, <clears throat> and on the screen right there is a, is a snapshot of, uh, of Mimama Aki, Mother Earth. And I would tell you that uh, we're looking down at the freshwater stronghold of Turtle Island, the freshwater stronghold of what is now uh, United, United States. And, and, I'm, and it takes me back to, to the stories that my elder Joe Rose Sr. used to, used to tell me. I remember he told me that uh, before there was thought, before there was thought and before all of the planets and everything else were created, he told me <clears throat> that there was a sound and, uh, and, he, and we were riding in the car as he was telling me, and he said, there was a sound in the universe. It was a shh, shh, shh. He said, and, <clears throat> and that sound was here from the beginning. He, he mentioned to me that, that's, that it's one of those, those <clears throat> uh, sounds that our, our shakers and some of our ceremonies actually call us back to, calls us back to in the beginning when the creator uh, decided to put his vision into play. And, and in that vision, he put all of the, all of the, the things that we see, you know, the, all the things in the universe, all those planets and all these places. He created Mother Earth, Nimama Aki. And, and when our prayers are sent out, he, he always told me to, to try to go back and acknowledge that and acknowledge the beauty of, of that vision and, and that vision manifesting here. And I know that uh, that listening to Walper Zett and some of the, the things that Walper Zett and, and rest their souls, these, these are elders that have walked on, but Walper Zett told that, that beautiful capture of how in the beginning, Nimama Aki, Mother Earth, was struggling to come to life. And uh, grandfather, son, Jesus, couldn't take it grandfather watching his daughter struggle to come to life couldn't take it was breaking breaking his heart and uh so he finally reached inside himself he took a piece of his heart and he placed it inside her and and with that at the center the center of the earth with that that heartbeat was able to to come forward you know to this day our drums at our powwows our drums at our ceremonies oftentimes you know they'll they'll tell you that those those drums represent the heartbeat of mother earth you know, and, and so <clears throat> those, those old stories take us back to um, how we're incredibly blessed to be here in real time on this planet and, and that all these gifts of, of uh, water and all of our, our relatives in the plant world and the animal world, how they're always all around us. <clears throat> they, they taught me that you know, conventional wisdom and in, in modern society, everybody views the natural world, everyone views life 
as a bit of a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is man standing there, humans at the top of that pyramid, um, as, as though we're in dominion over Mother Nature. But, uh, but our elders always remind us that, uh, that in our Ojibwe worldview, that pyramid is actually inverted. And, and human beings, we as people, are, are the most pitiful. Um, without Mother Nature, um, we go away. Without human beings, Mother Nature thrives. And, uh, and so there's some humility to that. And uh, so that brings me to, uh, to a story that, that Joe Rose uh, taught me. And, and I, I'll just tell it quick because we don't have a lot of time. But he said, when, when, Anishinaabe, <clears throat> when Anishinaabe first arrived here on this planet, came down from the, the stars, um, Anishinaabe was locked up. He said, uh, this place was so beautiful and, and everything was so unbelievable that Anishinaabe human couldn't move. He was standing there and standing there on the on the surface of Nimama Aki, Mother Earth here, and he couldn't even take a step. To take a step, he said, was <clears throat> was a taking. To take a step was as a cosmic giant, uh, brand new on the surface of this planet, was unbelievably impactful. He said everywhere he looked, Anishinaabe seen beauty and, and just wonder. Uh, every little step that he would take in that forest, there was little universes and little galaxies all around. Underneath that little mushroom was a whole system of insects and life playing out. Over there underneath that little bitty tree was, was a whole world in, in, a, in a galaxy of, of mutualisms and, and things interacting in a good way. And to take that step, was to destroy. He said, and so Anishinaabe was locked up, couldn't even move on this place. And that's where he put his hand out flat like that. And he tapped it like this. He said, that's where tobacco, Asema, came in to help. That spirit stood up and Asema helps us unlock. He says, we, we take that tobacco and we put that tobacco down and we, we say to the creator, I'm sorry. We say, I'm pitiful. and sorry for taking and here's some tobacco as an offering. He said, and with that, Anishinaabe was finally able to take a step. He said, Anishinaabe could finally start to move. He said, if you go to a powwow, Mike, he goes, if you go to a powwow, watch them dance, he goes, you'll see those little steps. He goes, the way that some of them, them dancers will dance, he goes, those two little steps at a time. He says, that's to call our minds back to how pitiful we are as takers, as cosmic giants in this place that just take and take and take those little steps remind us to be humble, to try to, to be in harmony, to try to be sustainable when we put our tobacco out. And, and uh, I always love that. And, and I always keep that in mind when, when uh, I think about, uh, think about Joe Rose's teachings when I'm around some of those ceremonial dances, when I'm around some of those powwows and stuff watching you know, all that beautiful guy and so many talented dancers out there. I was think about the, the origin of that. And, and so, so in this place, in this place here, along Lake Superior and Freshwater Stronghold, <clears throat> our people migrated from the ocean, the East Coast, and you got our migration story that brought us on through to the Great Lakes that eventually brought us to our final stopping place here in Lake Superior, the western arm of Lake Superior. And that final stopping place was, was Madeline Island in the Apostle Islands, what we now know as the Apostle Islands. The Ojibwe word for that is Moningwanakanig, and uh, roughly translates to uh, home of the yellow-shafted woodpecker, which is otherwise called a, a common northern flicker. But Moningwanakanig became the, the geopolitical social center of the Anishinaabe nation. Our migration story was, was driven and, and we arrived at Madeline Island in this place um, through vision and ceremony where the spirits told us to, to find the place where food grows on the water. The place where food grows on the water is manumen or wild rice. And, and out of that, out of that center that is right here, uh, connected into our reservation, connected right into the Red Cliff, our, 
uh, Musquatacong uh, Reservation is that island out there. And, it, and it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to be uh, Gichigumi and Miniwook, you know, big lake people. Um, our connection to Lake Superior is profound. Um, our connection to the island, uh, Morning Wanakaning, Madeline Island is profound. I always think of uh, uh, Anton Troyer, Dr. Troyer, who I heard said, uh, and, and it stuck with me, um, you know, we may not all live on Morning Wanakaning anymore, but Morning Wanakaning, the island is still at the center of uh, so many of our ceremonies. And, uh, and, and so it is. <clears throat> and that connectivity to the big lake, you see it in, in different ways. Our people interact in the shorelines and the sacredness of some of the stones that are found nowhere else in the world, but then right here in Mushkazidi, right here in the western side of Lake Superior, the connectivity to the shorelines and those stones, uh, all the way into uh, the fact that Lake Superior is, is, is a healer. And, uh, and, the, and the waters are healing, being around those shorelines is healing. Our connectivity and our, and our connection to the big lake is just uh, absolutely profound and beautiful. And, and that reminds me of uh, one of our old teachings. You know, there, I wanna say respectfully, you know, the, the Bible talks about a flood and, and some, of our, some of our stories acknowledge more than one flood. And, uh, and there's a story about a, a spirit, a Dobbin, that the creator, <clears throat> and, uh, the creator arrived at a place of possibly remaking Mother Earth and, uh, and was looking to, to move that way. Uh, folks weren't, uh, weren't showing gratitude. Folks weren't remembering um, all that went into creating the beauty and the wonder of this place. And, and so there was going to be a, a new a new doorway uh, to pass through and this place was set to be remade. The story says that, uh, the story goes that Badaban, the spirit vouched for Anishinaabe said, no, there's still some that remember. And he, and he was sent out to search for that and uh, searched and searched and searched until he was about to fail. And when he was about to fail, he came across an Anishinaabe family on the shorelines of, uh, of the big lake. And there they were putting their tobacco down, remembering to, to give thanks, remembering to acknowledge all that is. And, uh, and he returned and he petitioned on our behalf. And, and, and through that petitioning, um, <clears throat> that flood, that remaking never occurred. And every morning they say, Ginu, Ginu, the, that golden eagle is sent out every morning to, to look. And, uh, and so, Part of our connectivity to the big lake and to these shorelines is that daybreak, daybreak we're told from our elders that daybreak is when the spirits, when our helpers are the most active. And daybreak is when we take that tobacco and we set that out there, put that in the water, put that on those shorelines, send that love out to everything around us. And they say, Ginu, that golden eagle is flying at daybreak, looking for that. And, uh, and when we do that as a people, that uh, we're always sending this, sending this world and sending those things around us and uh, into the future in a good way. And so uh, our connectivity to the big lake is, is uh, it transcends on a, on a lot of different levels on, on how we interact with this place. It's more than a place to get unbelievably beautiful fish and, and, uh, and more than just aesthetic beauty and wonder. It's, it's dialed into uh, to our worldview and, and into our prayers. So, um, so in our home, I want to acknowledge that we're water rich here in, in the Great Lakes region. We're water rich on account of fire. You know, across, across the Great Lakes are, <clears throat> are four billion year old volcanic remnants, you know, when, when earth was being put together and the, our elders talk, you know, that the creator used air, land, water, and fire to make this place. And, and now instead of lava, it's kind of pumping around here. There's a, there's a lot of water. There's a lot of groundwater flowing up from under earth. And we're in a place that has more than its fair share of, of storms and, and water from the sky. And, and 
And that gets me into a little bit of what I wanted to share about our home being essentially uh, Lush Gazebe, home of the Thunderbirds. <clears throat> Joe Rose, lots of my elders would always talk about this place being home of the Thunderbirds and, uh, and that uh, those round ones, they would talk about these, these sacred stones being their, their Thunderbird eggs. And, and, and so again, the land and the water carry the, the echo memory of a lot of our old stories. So, <clears throat> so when we get into the Great Lakes, you know, the our old Indians would always experience the world multidimensionally in our culture. You know, we were taught that as one example, all birds are messengers. Most sacred of all is Mikazi, the eagle, uh, sent from the creator, messenger, messenger to the creator. And, uh, and so <clears throat> I can remember uh, an elder talking to me about Bigfoot said, uh, old Indians, he said, they experience the world multidimensionally, Mike. He says, uh, he goes, <clears throat> like an eagle. He goes, it could be an eagle. He goes, it could be an actual eagle that visits you. He goes, but it might be that rock over there that looks exactly like an eagle. He goes, it could be that cloud that just blew in that looks exactly like an eagle. He's like, that's up to you to, to watch and to, to feel and to and to lock into how you're experiencing this place. He goes, he goes, I get a kick out of the Bigfoot hunters. He says, I watched, uh, watched a show the other night where they were hunting Bigfoot. He said, and uh, he says, and they found him and they didn't even realize it. I go, oh yeah, and I kind of looked at him and I kind of smiled, you know. He said, <clears throat> yeah, there was a little butterfly that came flying in, flew all around them. He says, and it landed right on that one Bigfoot hunter shirt he said, and that was him right there. He says, but, but they don't realize that. And, and I thought that was just a, a beautiful little story that captured how uh, a lot of our elders interact with mother nature and how they interact with uh, different things. And, uh, and so in the spirit of, of uh, what my grandma Lily used to always say, using our magic nation, she'd always, she'd always tell me when I was a little kid, she'd have a rainy day box. You know? Only when it was storming out would I get access to the rainy day box. And it was a hodgepodge of about 75 different things. You know, some of these baubles that I think all grandmas have those great big jewelry pieces that, you know, different colors. But I remember there was, uh, <clears throat> there were Monopoly pieces in it too, but just anything you can imagine. And she would hand that to me during storms and she would always say, use your magic nation now, Mike. And I would just sit there with that box and I would just play all these little games and I'd have little little gatherings and I'd have wars and you name it I mean I would just sit there and play and 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 I always think what a blessing you know she taught me how to use my imagination to a certain extent but it also helps the color it helps the color how we see and when I when I think about the different things that are that my elders have have led me to and have tried to share with me um, what I would share with you is that Washka Zibi is home of the Thunderbirds you know, I have again the picture of Mother Earth and the Great Lakes up here. I don't know if many, if, if you guys could see it, but on the western arm of Lake Superior, the Bad River watershed is actually lit up and highlighted, uh, colored in light blue, and the reservation is kind of highlighted there just to, to dial you in where we're at. But <clears throat> this is a lead thunderbird nest, and, uh, and it's water rich on account of fire. The, the Great Lakes have often been described as having a ring of fire in the form of a remnant fire, i.e., or, or as a way of saying, uh, the, the metallic mineral bodies that are captured at the surface all around. And a lot of times nowadays we see uh, people and companies wanna, wanting access at that metallic mineral through mining and things like that. But the, but those, <clears throat> but that remnant fire is is really important to think about. Um, that remnant fire, that metallic mineral, is is uh, lava that got cooled at the surface and. And so we'll dive into that a little bit here in a, in a minute, but, but using limnology, you know, in, in science, limnology is the study of shape of water, the study of uh, the shape of water and waterways. Um, <clears throat> I would just, just bring it to the, into that the Great Lakes is that lead Thunderbird nest where water rich on account of fire. 
in this in this map right here, using the analogy, which is just the uh, the study of shape of water, you can see all birds are messengers. Mega Z is the most sacred of all. Everything I would need to know as an old older, and and I'll say soon to be elder. Uh, I'm 54 years old now, but everything I would need to know about the Great Lakes is captured in this moment when I recognize and the Great Lakes lights up as as that lead thunderbird, an eagle carrying food for its babies here in this lead thunderbird nest. And in the bottom interpretation, I, I lead you to that a little bit. Um, and I put a dot, I put a dot in the heart of that, that lead thunderbird. And that dot, <clears throat> that dot is about 40 to 50 miles north of Munising, Michigan. And that is the deepest point in Lake Superior. And, uh, and it's not random. Uh, the deepest point in Lake Superior is the lowest place on Turtle Island. Um, I, if you Google the lowest place on North America, it'll take you out to like Death Valley, someplace out in the desert there in the canyon. But they're not counting the low places that are underwater. Um, and, and it's not random. The lowest place in the center of our lead Thunderbird here is the closest place to the center of the earth where that heartbeat is going, where all of that original fire fought its way to the surface billions of years ago, where that, where that source of life is. And, and I wanna say a, a quick note about that. You know, I was a Catholic school child, won eight years at St. Agnes and Liz was my classmate and I used to have to help her with reading and stuff like that. Oh God, she's, you know, I, I, I might get stuff thrown at me here, so hold on. No, but uh, um, we, went, we went through uh, Catholic school together and I was taught, I was taught that but below my feet in the earth was fire and brimstone and that, that it wasn't a very positive thing. It took me a long time to, to decolonize and to be able to understand that air, land, water, and fire were sources of life and creation. You know, the center of the earth has an electromagnetic realm to it. It uh, is comprised of primarily iron, but gold, copper, nickel, silver, all those metallic mineral metals that are, that are found at the surface with us, they're all there at the center of the earth. And that electromagnetic realm has, has functionality to it. Um, if everyone remembers back the Mayan calendar deal back in 2012, we were all scared about uh, the pole shift, but the center of the earth helps keeps the poles balanced. And the center of the earth throws an electromagnetic grid out around mother earth that helps keep meteors off of our backs, which as the dinosaurs would attest to is a very positive thing for life. And and wherever you find volcanic activity, you're seeing new land, new life forming, where you see ancient volcanic remnant, like here in the Great Lakes, you see an unbelievable cradle of life. And, and there's something to be said about the Great Lakes. It's the most stable geological bedrock on, on the planet. Um, you know, at, at eight pounds per gallon, uh, with, with the top and the bottom of the earth melting, and redistributing weight on uh, this fragile tectonic plate system that's been in an epic slumber. Um, having the most stable geologic bedrock around us uh, and having access to unbelievable water is very, very uh, important for, for going into the future with climate change and all those other things. But, but this is that lead Thunderbird nest and all those different things that we could muse on by way of life, water, land, all of that is captured in one quick hit when I see Mega Z carrying food for its babies. And so on the western arm of Lake Superior, we start honing in on Bad River and Moaning Wanakonic, Madeline Island. And and this is a this is a snapshot of my home. There's a there's a few pictures uh, if if folks can see uh, on their computer screens. You can see the Manuman that's that's dovetailed up on the shorelines of Lake Superior in our reservation. We have 40% of the wetlands of Lake Superior here on our res, over 40%. We have beautiful uh, river systems. <clears throat> As in terms of in terms of uh, important places, Madeline Island, Moningwanaconic, and and this area, it's probably the most power-packed 
you know, in, in a kind of a, a small package. It's the most power packed habitat uh, in Lake Superior. This area on that I'm showing, you know, the Bayfield County realm, uh, a little bit of the North Shore, but the Apostle Islands as it relates to the Kokogan Sloughs and the, the Bad River wetlands, it, it is habitat that is so powerful, it's driving the overall health and welfare of the greater expanse of Lake Superior. To say it's a power place is a bit of an understatement. And, I, and I'm reminded of uh, <clears throat> a reporter asking uh, the, the noted climate author and environmental author, Wendell Berry, he said, he said, to Wendell, he said to Wendell Berry, he said, uh, what makes land sacred? And Wendell Berry incredulous, incredulously answers, it's all sacred. And, and that's the truth. But at the same time, I would tell you that, and I would encourage you to, to go with me for a minute. It's all sacred. The greater expanse of Lake Superior to make a claim that this small area is driving the overall health and welfare. We have to switch from and, and acknowledge that it's all sacred and start to switch into looking at functionality. And the functionality of this place is such that even as an example, in, uh, when we sit down and talk about fish negotiations on the big lake with the state of Wisconsin, all the biologists, both tribal and state biologists understand that what happens here in the fishery drives what's gonna happen over on the North shore and it's gonna drive <clears throat> what happens way over, I don't know if you guys will be able to see this, but way over east of the Keweenaw Peninsula, um, over towards Sault Ste. Marie. This is, from a functional standpoint, an unbelievable place, over 40% of the wetlands driving the overall health because of the micro power packed habitat that's here. And, and, and what that has to do with us as Ojibwe is when our old people who are on par with some of the best outdoorsmen and outdoors women that the world has ever seen, the most adaptable, the most uh, ingenious in terms of the watercraft and waters being highways at that time. They didn't choose random. This was the place where food grows on the water. This was that power packed habitat realm that was unbelievably conducive to life. And when they made it the center, when they made it the center of the Anishinaabe world, it wasn't random. It was rooted into the fact that it was that powerful a place. And it's hard to, it's hard to try to convey that um, in, our, in our modern minds. Uh, I've, I've had guys from LCO and Leech Lake and St. Croix, oh yeah, you're trying to say Bad River is the best. And I'm like, no, no, actually I'm not. Um, it, it's, it's an old, it's an old, old lens that really comes through those ancient people, our people, but when they were, when we were ancient a long time ago and they were trying to figure everything out as to, as to where to relocate on our, on our migration from the East Coast. It's not random and, and this is that place. And so there's an old story. There's an old story that says you can sit out in the wild rice beds right out there with the big lake and uh, you can sit out on the wild rice beds and Joe Rose Sr. would tell that story. He said, you can look to the West, he says, towards Minnesota. He goes, and there you'll see, he would tell me, there you'll see the Bayfield County high hills. He says, and, and to the West, you'll see those high hills. He says, look to the South, he goes, and especially late season after leaf drop or early during spring walleye season, you can see the Pinocchio Mountains 26 miles away, Mike, he says, Bayfield County high hills to the west, he says the Pinocchio Mountains to the south and to the east you'll see Graveyard Creek and the start of the Keweenaw Peninsula and that snow belt. He goes, you got those high places lined up all around you with the big lake on your back. He goes, <clears throat> what you need to remember is that all the water coming off those high places is rushing right at you in that moment. He goes, and when, when you realize that all that water is coming at you from those places, you, you all, all of a sudden you might get the feeling that you're in the bottom of a bowl. He goes, but Mushkazibi is in a bowl. He says, Mushkazibi has always been home to Anamakeba Nesiwag, those Thunderbirds, and this is their nest. And so that gets me to the western arm of Lake Superior. And on the bottom map, I colored Madeline Island red for you. And I put a little piece of wild rice 
up on the top is a map of the western arm of Great Lakes. And on the bottom is that little Thunderbird nest that I just described. Madeline Island is red. That's home of the flicker. And I would just tell you the quick translation to that is that a flicker actually has a red nape across the back of its neck. It's got black mottled spotting on its body. You got the Apostle Islands there. And uh, up by its tail feathers, it's got a big dollop of white feathers that you can see real easily when it flies away from you. And so on our, on our little map here of our little Thunderbird that's flying with that lead Thunderbird that we looked at earlier, whether you use Pie Island or Isle Royal, <clears throat> you can see that, uh, that the western arm of Lake Superior lights up as that little flicker. And uh, when we get to Long Island and the Cacogan Sloughs and our wetlands, our, our wetlands, they actually form uh, little talons that grip our wild rice beds, our ancient wild rice beds. And the lightning bolts coming down, the one that goes straight down is Bad River, going to the Pinocchio Mountains up there, Caroline Lake. And the other one that veers to the left there, that's the White River. And so again, the land and the water carry the echo memory of our old stories. Uh, Bad River has always been home of the Thunderbirds, this is their nest, and uh, Moaning Wanakonig is home of the, of the flicker. And uh, so that's just the way of seeing. And so there's important things that I, I wanted to mention. <clears throat> this map here takes us into uh, an overall look at uh, where the Bad River Cacogan Sloughs are. You can see the waterways and how unbelievably water rich we are. But when you get down to the Southwest, when you get down to the bottom, there's the ironwood formation and that's where that metallic mineral sits on our on our uh, in our watershed now they wanted to mine all of that and destroy up that whole area but that is the the recharge for the groundwater of our reservation and this map here looks like a big blob looks like a big wispy kind of spirit this this blue map is really interesting what looks like uh, blue water reaching out is actually Wispy, those wispy areas are actually water pouring down and pouring into the groundwater underneath the earth below our reservation. And that's where we, that's where our drinking water comes from. And so when you look at where those, those areas are really strong, those areas are unbelievably powerful, tied right up into where the metallic mineral is. And, and there's an interesting thing with that metallic mineral body you know, <clears throat> thousands of miles away at the center of the earth, um, there's, there's heat and molten lava. And I mentioned earlier, gold, nickel, silver, iron, all those things that are at the surface with us are at the center of the earth. And those old volcanic lava tubes that fought their way to the surface and helped create this place a long time ago, those old lava tubes, those old pathways are still here. And, <clears throat> and so it's important it's important for me to convey as an old Indian that, that these rocks have a purpose. These rocks are alive. These rocks are sacred around us. <clears throat> and I wanna explain that a little bit really quickly. At the bottom of this picture here, at the center of the earth, I drew that as a strawberry. And as part of my story, I'll, I'll say real quick that uh, we went to vision up there in the Pinocchio's. And in my vision, I was told to to give everything away. A lot of old Indians, when they, when they have visions and they have things of meaning come to them, um, they, won't, they won't share that stuff. Uh, sometimes there, there's the, that notion that you're giving away your personal power and it's meant for you, uh, you as an individual. In, in my experience, um, I was told to share and, and to, to give everything away and I'm okay with that. Uh, everything that I'm sharing is, is trying to help better an understanding of how this place functions so that people don't come here and destroy the watershed with mining, that we don't experience a 700,000 barrel oil spill in our waterways and, and that we send this place into the future. It's really a, a bit of a prayerful notion of love really to, to share. And so we went to the Pinocchio's in vision and there's some really awesome, amazing elders that were conducting that ceremony. And we went out into the woods and you had to open a little lodge by yourself and 
fasted and you had to pray, things like that. And, and an old man arrived that night and uh, I looked out I looked out of my lodge and I looked over and I could see that old man. He was crouched like a baseball catcher. And he, and he, and he waved me over with his hand like, come here. When I went over there behind him, there was a hole there. And he pointed over to the, pointed to the hole behind him and he said, look. And I looked down and way down there, long ways away, I could see this beautiful red ember. And, uh, and I pulled my head back like in surprise. And I looked at him and I, and he said, look, and I looked again, and there was that beautiful red glowing ember down that long, long tube way down there. And as I was moving my head back in that last split second, or I'll even say, as they say, ignosecond. An ignosecond is when you're closing the car door and you see your car keys in it, but you can't stop it and you close the door. That's an ignosecond. That's how fast it was. But, uh, but in that last ignosecond, center of the earth look like a strawberry. So I, I drew a little strawberry on here to, to take you down to the center of the earth. And those lava tubes are still here. Those lava tubes come up from deep down into, into that molten realm. And hot rock is coming into contact with deep, deep earthen moisture. Steams, steam pressure is building up, steam pressure is pushing out. And steam pressure pushes deep earthen water Anyone that's ever dealt with carpentry knows what I'm about to say. Water does what water does. It jumps in the path of least resistance, which is the old lava tubes themselves. And it starts rushing up from deep under earth. Now, along the way, before it surfaces on, a, in our case, up here in Mushkazibi in the Pinocchi Mountains, it surfaces and it percolates through these things called metallic mineral bodies, because that metal is your sign. That metal, metal is your tangible, simplistic sign that you have unbelievable lava tube connectivity down to Mother Earth herself. And so that water percolates through, and we know the science, right? Copper cleanses water, copper filters water. Those, some, a lot of those metals are unbelievably beautiful for clean water. But that cold water rushes up on top of the mountain, surfaces onto the planet with us, percolates through the side of the mountain and rushes on down recharges our groundwater aquifers, the water we're drinking under earth. It is a, a bit of a source of life. And so you have these, these 22 mile long rocks up there, these great big Chi, um, Chi Mishomasin, these giant grandfather rocks, 22 mile long pieces of granite holding that metallic mineral up in the earth. And on a map that I'm showing you, it's just, a, it's just a quick way our elders helped us arrive at these understandings <clears throat> that those rocks are, are doing, a, they got work to do. They hold that metallic mineral up in the sky. All of that, you know, USGS scientists come along and they look around and they say, oh, this is a recharge, recharge of the water of the Bad River watershed. But when you think about, uh, when you think about mining, as we always think like, oh, mining, they're going to go way down deep in the earth. You look at Lake Superior at 600 feet, and I drew a line across the res, the Bad River Reservation, and its clay-based soils is at about six, 700 feet. When you get into the foothills by Highbridge and Mellon, you're at 700, 1100 feet. Pinocchi's around 1500 feet. Mining company by us, they weren't gonna go deeper than a thousand feet. Those rocks are holding that metal up into the sky, and that all of those lava tubes are conducting that earth and cold water. It rushes down really quickly through Copper Falls, and it rushes out into Lake Superior. There's a reason for that. That's, that's an earthen process that is all about life. We as humans on the bottom of the, of the pyramid get to go through in a good way, living life along with fish and all the animals and all the plants. And so, <clears throat> so the, this place is, is powerful. So I drew a thunderstorm. And Joe Rose used to talk about how thunderbirds are synonymous with those thunderstorms. They're spirits that travel with those thunderstorms. He says they come across the plains and those, those low flying balls of electromagnetic energy are gathering up energy and speed and power. He says they hit the land at 10,000 lakes, Minnesota, and they're starting to suck up water. By the time they hit the Western Arm of Lake Superior, he says they're rolling and they're massive thunderstorm systems. We happen to have billions of 
pounds of metallic metal held up in the sky around us. Electromagnetically charged, that area will spin a compass and be connected to the center of the Earth, which is an electromagnetic generator. We have over a billion tons of metal held up in the sky, and it calls these, these thunderstorms in. So when, when we say Mushkazibi is home of the Thunderbirds, you could say in another lens, just one way of seeing, that river is home of those thunderstorms. This place calls them in, that electromagnetic conductivity. And so at the very top of this little diagram, I drew number one, and I drew a, a heart for love. When you think about climate change and that drought could be coming, you got all these thunderstorms getting called in. And that's water is life. That is, a, that is an unbelievable, awesome insurance policy for climate change and drought. And then number two over here is that we live where the actual landscape is a regional groundwater pump that's pumping water into our aquifers and water up onto the top of Mimamaki, Mother Earth with us. And, and that's the second piece. We got water from deep under Earth where hot rock and moisture are coming into contact with each other. That's, a, that's one, two, that's a one, two punch of love from the creator that's rooted in water. And water is in that globe. All of our babies arrive in that water. Water uh, announces and heralds our arrival onto this planet when that water breaks and all of our mothers went through that. And here we are. Water is that sacred, sacred conductor of life. And, and this place has two unbelievably powerful earthen processes that make this rich. And that dovetails back into the fact that it's a unbelievable habitat. It's a power place. And, and all people, red, white, black, and yellow, get to go through, get to go through and live beautiful, good lives, get to send respect and love for each other and love for this place out into the universe because of the power of these places here. And so I'm going to just kind of <clears throat> say that uh, praying during the mining battle, I got, to, I got to see a thunderbird out on the big lake formed up over that, that thunderstorm. And, and, I'm, and I'm sharing that uh, in, a, in a good way to say that, uh, you know, those those storms and, and, and all of the water that's, that's here um, tied into our old stories, tied into this being the home of the Thunderbirds, the place where food grows on the water, the home of Moning Wanakane, Flicker, um, that it's all about love. And, uh, and love is the current, humility is the throttle. And in our home here in Bad River, when our elders and our, our warriors stand up, in this case, stopping the transport of sulfuric acid across old rickety trestles here on our res. When they put their lives on the line, <clears throat> there's a thousand year memory at work and there's a thousand year vision, seventh generation vision of trying to pass all the good stuff that we have in real time right now in 2023 into the future, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. When you think about when you think about how fast things are changing, um, if we can keep this place intact, that's going to be really, really beautiful for all of those babies that are still on the way. And the last thing I'm going to say is for all of the young people that don't have children yet, um, you will someday, and and your heart's going to burst. You're going to think like, how could I love anything anymore? You're going to have your second child, and you think it's impossible to love anymore, and then your heart's going to expand. For all of the older people that are listening that have children, you already know what I'm talking about. And when you think about the fact that if you got the privilege of living 200 years and seeing your grandchild arrive 200 years from now, you're gonna love that grandchild the same way you loved your daughter, the same way you loved your son when they arrived on this place. That, that is a real current and that is a real time kind of unfolding of time space relativity that propels these warriors like this right here, Butch Stone and Jimmy LeGrew, to stand on the tracks, to lay down and sit down on those tracks and stop a great big train from hauling sulfuric acid through the reservation because it's just too risky. Um, we don't do that to be contrary. We don't do it to be negative. It's rooted in love. It's rooted in protection of resources. 
for uh, all life and, and uh, into the future. And so, so with that, um, I'm going to end my talk and I'll open up for question and answer. And thank you all for listening. I covered a lot of ground, but uh, but it's uh, and I hope people got a little something uh, from from everything I shared. It's, uh, I'll just say that much. Thank you. Which. Thanks, Mike. Much appreciated. We do have a couple of questions for you, <clears throat> but we are definitely open to getting some more. So if anyone has any questions, please put those in the Q&A. And yes, the chat will be opened uh, a little bit later here. So Mike, uh, Ali Raven asks, what we call ourselves is important. There have been many initiatives um, uh, throughout Indian country to change the names of people's places, teams, etc., that are in, that have are insulted, are insulting, or incorrectly translated from the original name our people gave them. Is there any thought to changing the name of Bad River to its original Medicine River? Because you alluded to that earlier, eh? Yeah, ab mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, we're we're in talks with uh, the Department of Transportation to do the to go after the dual language. Um, uh, the dual signs, dual language signs, you know, that uh, that will, will sit along the highways and things like that. But when I think about <clears throat> what we've been through with some of our environmental protection issues, um, from news media to, and I'll just say it because it's the truth, Republican legislators, a lot of them with a smirk love to say uh, bad water instead of bad river. Um, and really, that's uh, that's a play on what I believe is just uh, a whole realm of, of uh, new phone kind of colonized words. Anyway, we want to get back to Mushkazidi Medicine River. Um, we want to explore and talk more with our elders about uh, Misquazidi uh, or Red River. Um, there's a couple of elders that have talked about that. But we want to get back to our Ojibwe language because it helps unlock some of these old stories and it, and it dovetails into uh, you know, some of the things that I tried to share tonight, it, it helps uh, broaden our understanding of who we are and what this place is about. Great. We've got another one um, from our friend across the bay here in Red Cliff. Jim Pete asks, in the teachings you shared, including the strawberry in the center of the earth, were these also shared with those that want to tap into earth and how and, and be made aware of how that would destroy the powerful and natural settings? of Nimama Aki. <clears throat> yeah, uh, definitely have been sharing a lot of these, um, I should say, views or lenses with state and federal entities. Um, what I learned during the mining battle is that I've seen unbelievably knowledgeable hydrologists talk for a long time about water, um, but stop when when, we, when asked to talk about rocks. And I've seen geologists who could wax away about rocks, but couldn't talk about water. And, and so I, I really, I'll, I'll send a shout out to UW-Madison and, and the Nelson Institute, but I love that interdisciplinary kind of realm of science. Our, our native viewpoints take holistic kind of uh, visions and, uh, and holistic teachings. Uh, and there's animacy in terms of functionality and purpose and how this stuff works. There's animacy and spirit. And, uh, and so conveying that and trying to help educate um, state and federal regulators and, and trying to, to be honest, just trying to educate companies that are just looking at our landscapes and waterways for profit as though it's all here for liquidation and profit. Um, we have a lot of work to do as indigenous people putting forward traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge to try to help uh, the powers that be in, this, in, this, in the federal government and the state government understand a lot's at stake and we need to really think about protection and preservation. We got another question, Mike, um, that kind of talks about how they can share this knowledge you shared with them tonight. So will they be able to share this with their friends? How do you want this knowledge to be shared? Can this, I mean, I assume you can share it, share it in classrooms in different places. Um, would it be appropriate for them to retell these types of stories or are some of these things only, you know, you can tell, but they can show the video. I, I um, everything I've shared is, is uh, for folks to, it's to light, 
little fires or maybe as it put forward little seeds to grow in, in thought. Um, there are scientists that are just amazing who, who can take bits and pieces of what we share and then expand on it. I, I have got really good friends that, that uh, bring their geology classes up and things like that. Um, Andrew Knudsen, Marsh University and others uh, that, that, that come up and in, in the interaction, um, expansion of how we uh, interact with our home and how we come to know our, our rocks, our waters, things like that. It, it, it really helps. It's, it's going to take all of us doing that. So everything that I've shared, I'm putting forward in a good way and it's, it's all there, um, you know, in, in the hopes that it helps somebody help somebody connect, you feel like uh, it's important to protect and, and also to feel connected, you know, we're, we're all um, air, land, water, and fire with spirit, you know, we are, we are cosmic stardust and, and, uh, and spirit, and, and I love that, I, I love that notion, so it's, it's, it's a crazy world, and so if there's anything that I can share that, that that helps people feel connected to Mother Earth and to understand. I mean, we're all sitting here at our computer screens and listening to our devices. 70% water, um, carbon, matter, cosmic stardust. You know, we look out at, at space and we say, well, that, where, where's uh, the, the Fermi paradox? They're like, where's all the intelligent life? And I look at it, I look at that stuff and, and I see intelligent life and animals see all around. And we say, well, that's that couldn't be animate. That nebula is just a collection of gases and carbon and, and matter, and it's given off uh, it's given off certain types of gases. That's all you're seeing. And then I'm looking at that person explaining that to me, and they're 70% water with carbon and matter, and they're exhaling carbon dioxide as a gas as they try to explain that to me. And and I just you know I think I subscribe to the notion that we are of Mother Earth and. Uh, you know, we're connected in spirit to, to the universe. And if, if anything that I've shared helps people understand that, that they matter and that they're special, um, you know, I feel good about that. And, and so share away, that's, that's, that's part of the giving. Excellent. I've got another one here. Uh, Anna said, did you say the round rocks on the South shore are Thunderbird eggs? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's a statement that probably that that would need to be unpacked uh, you know, in a different discussion and probably with, with more knowledgeable elders than I. But yeah, that, that is what I said. And uh, th those rocks are sacred. You know, to, to get at that, I always, always refer to John Fire Lame Deer. Uh, there was a book written about him uh, called Lame Deer Seeker Visions, if you ever look at that. But in, the, in that book, he says, uh, he says at one point, he says to the ethnobiographer, all things in nature will talk to you. Of course, the most vocal are the rocks. <laughs> it just make you laugh. But, but, uh, those rocks are sacred over there. And there's, there's a lot of things associated with, with some of our lakeshore power places and some of those sacred rocks that uh, we're encouraged not to talk about. Um, and I'll, I'll respect that. Yeah, I think it's interesting because um, I think for uh, maybe some other cultures or non-native cultures, um, they don't always put together things like they see and think they have um, kind of a meaning, a meaning that maybe we do. So I think when they hear things like that, they get very excited because they, they recognize those rocks. They know those rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and Here's an, I'll, I'll share this because yeah. I was taught this when I was a little kid by my grandparents, my grandmas, I should say. Um, when it comes to the concretions and, and those round rocks, my grandma used to always teach, um, you know, you should try not to take those, Michael. They say you should try not to take those, Michael. And if you do take one of those, make sure you bring it back again. Uh, those, those little spirits are going to come and get them. And so it was, a, it was a, a real gentle teaching about trying to leave that stuff there. And to that end, I'll just say this, that has anyone... Has anyone listening ever really sent their mind around a lakeshore walk that's uh, maybe 500 years old where millions of agates are littering that, that rock bed, having not been collected by 
uh, the indigenous people, or um, the fact that flecks of copper and gold and some of those, those uh, what we now call precious metals were strewn about. That, that rock bed um, vision with daylight cracking across the big lake, um, I've looked at that a few times in, in, my, in my mind and it's unbelievably beautiful. And that notion, that notion and those teachings uh, from my grandparents that were passed down is all about leaving that stuff. It's all about, again, uh, not coveting and, and taking. Um, really, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a layered teaching about sharing. Well, we've, we've kind of run out of time, I think, although I think many of us uh, wish it was a little bit longer tonight. Um, I've got a screen, a screen up right now showing you how you can get a hold of Mike. I use that picture in particular because that's his current Facebook uh, profile pic. Hey, Mike. Yeah. So um, you'll you'll be able to recognize. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the picture where that was taken? And I was taken in Big Slough out in Kakagan, uh, out by our, our wild rice beds on the reservation here. I was racing with my daughter that day. Um, I got that big smile right there because uh, it's really hot and I was <laughs> so happy. No. I, uh, it was a great day. We made a lot of rice, my daughter Madeline and I. And uh, this past year, uh, the Kokogan rice beds were were unbelievably flush with wild rice. It felt like a, a real time blessing. And a lot of our people just had banner years. It, it really is a gift. Um, that wild rice arrives right before the winter. It's an incredible, uh, incredibly powerful sacred food that uh, takes us into the winter. It also takes us deep into our ceremonies, being able to send good things out uh, to all those helpers. Yeah, definite shout out to Maddie and Paigey, his beautiful daughters um, tonight. Uh, wonderful, strong women, just like their parents. So that's great to see. Um, the next one I did want to point out, if you could uh, to tell us some feedback tonight, we'd appreciate that. You can go to our, our website, our survey, and fill it. It's very brief. And then if you're interested to learn more about what we do or how we do it, you can connect with us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, lots, lots of different places. Uh, I did want to point out that Mike's recording, this recording will be available on YouTube later this week, maybe as early as tomorrow which is fantastic. You can find it at the same website you registered on. So the, the link will be there. Otherwise, it will definitely live forever in YouTube. And we do, and as Mike said, we encourage you to use it, share it with your friends, share, share the knowledge. Um, we're, we're thrilled to be able to bring that to you. And we're thrilled that Mike was able to share his knowledge and his time with us tonight. Another shout out is uh, going to the Discovery Center down in or North Atlanta Discovery Center down in Manitowish Waters, which had a first watch party. So got a flambeau friend down there, Leisha. Uh, so that's great. We've got uh, folks from all over the state and country joining us. And I hope you guys all come back next week when we have Kubi Val Barber, uh, another beautiful elder. She's from Lakutare. She was one of my daughter's uh, Ojibwe language teachers, my Vidi's teacher. And Paigey, Mike's daughter I mentioned, is Vidi's current Ojibwe language teacher. It is a beautiful thing, and Mike could probably talk for another hour on how important our language revitalization is. It is. Big stuff. Yeah, actually, absolutely. Very Any, important. Thanks again, Mike. Any final thoughts? No, just uh, really honored to, and you know, really honored to be here. And, and thank you, thank you, Liz, and everyone else for the the opportunity. Um, reach out, uh, messenger, texting. Reach out if anyone has anything they would like to talk about or share. I'm open to that. So uh, look forward to that. Wonderful. Good night, everybody. Miigwech. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Good night.